um, our right to healthy, affordable, and culturally appropriate foods and uh, access to arable lands, right? And that work, it also seeks to restore relationships between uh, ourselves and um, the earth, other living beings, and our cultural practices. We'll talk more about that later. Why is it doing this? Um, and uh, um, building the type of power resources necessary in order to create the, um, you know, the, the world that we want to see building power, right? We, we assert that food apartheid is about the inequitable distribution of power. Um, and that's what creates food inequities. And so I don't know what the heck is happening. You see that? I'm not sure. I don't know what's going on. My bad, y'all. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so, and, and it also seeks to undo the imperialist um, kind of, you know, underpinning that, um, I don't know what the heck that is. I don't know. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, move past that. So, um, so sovereignty as a framework, right? Uh, it, it is for us very, um, it's central to the work that we do. It's not just an idea. It's not um, for us a, uh, just enough to say that we're moving towards sovereignty and not be real about what that looks like operationally. And so again, we're gonna talk about that later. Um, and we can talk more about that, how we do that in our front facing work. This is more of a focus on our, you know, uh, internal work and how we are setting that up. However, I just, I want to say that for us, as we showed in the, the first um, slide that we have, which is also the last slide that we have, that the sovereignty work is, is, a, is much bigger. Um, and it's about how do we actually have more control uh, in the works that we do at, uh, um, within our liberation struggle. And so, um, when we talk about black land and food sovereignty, sovereignty is the cheap aim um, and food and land are vehicles. I mentioned that before. Um, and I mentioned also about black liberation being a part of it. And if, if we think about it in what? one way, it, it could uh, be seen as or look like um, seeking to be fully human um, as we live out the so-called American dream, right? Which, which you might be able to say that, maybe not using the same values, but the idea of being uh, free, right? Freedom, justice, uh, you know, liberty, all of these values that are espoused by the United States of America, but actually uh, doing the work to um, fulfill that in the best ways that we can and um, creating the actual pathways for how we do that while doing it in ways that don't directly uh, prop up and lift up um, whiteness, white culture, white people and white institutions, but doing it in a way that affirms how we want to be and allow us to control our own destinies. And I bring that last point up because, you know, often we, I get this question a lot. When you talk about sovereignty, are you talking about not paying taxes or what are you talking about? I think that that could be a part of it, but I think that what, what ultimately what we're talking about is the pursuit of defining how we want to be uh, in the context that we, uh, that we work within and how we identify and moving in that. And so again, this, this presentation being about uh, presenting ideas and notions that we uh, stand firm to in this moment about how we actually do that in an institutional way. Let's talk about culture. Sorry, y'all. Um, let's hear really quickly Dr. Marimba Ani talk about, um, about culture and, and its significance as uh, an, like a, an immune system for the people. What does it do for us? It brings us from chaos into order. It brings order to chaos. That's what culture does. Culture is powerful. Yeah. European understands that. It binds us to each other. It gives us identity. It gives us a reason for surviving. And then it tells us Woo. who we should live for and who we should die for if we have to. Culture is an energy source for thriving. 
Mm. And it gives us a sense of security. It also puts us into a system of accountability. We are accountable to our ancestors. Now, with you looking at all of that, and it's a template for living, then think about it. And it is a petri dish. Mm, wow. So that African culture becomes a petri dish, it produces Africans. Ah, it cultivates ah. Africans. And no other culture can make that statement. Mm, mm, mm. You hear me? Mm. No other culture can produce and cultivate Africans. Mm. Mm. Only African culture can do that. Mm. If we look at culture like that, and see it as a means by which a people <coughs> protect themselves, then we could understand culture as the immune system mm. of a people. Oh, yeah. Think of people as an organism. And culture is that immune system, right? Mm. OK. Now what does the immune system do? Mm. The immune system, you have the, the T cells, you've got the lymphocytes, which become the warriors, mm. right? Their job is to recognize the antigen. Well, an antigen is a foreign body which threatens the health of the whole. Mm. And that's where you get that sink and destroy, mm. all right? That's right? Because their job is to neutralize right. or eliminate in any way that disease, that mm. poison, right, right. those antigens, mm. those things that work against the health of the whole. Okay? Yeah. Now, we look at culture as that. <laughs> Genetic memory, mm. if you read the medical journals, is connected to the immune system. Mm. They all talk about that. And I'm fascinated with genetic mm. memory. Mm. So that there are these memory cells which, which carry the knowledge and information about how to defeat the disease. And I'm saying culture is all of that. Mm. Right? OK, so what happens? You got the ma'afa. Everybody know what the ma'afa is? Yeah. Ma'afa is a great disaster. That's the, the kidnapping of us and all of that. The disconnecting mm. us from that cultural mm. wound. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Okay. The ma'afa carries a virus. Mm. Wow. Mm. The virus is the Yubu virus. Mm. Mm. See, all of this is very culture specific. This is all about us. I ain't talking about anybody mm. else right now. I'm talking about us. Ah. When we use the term. My apology for stopping that abruptly. Um, I, I hope that 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 generally, you know, uh, um, that you have enough information to to um, to kind of follow along with some of the points that I want to kind of lift up in my analysis of what Dr. Marimbani is talking about um, and what she is explaining and sharing with the world in this short clip is from a, a lecture um, in explaining her. Uh, foundational text and seminal text uh, called Yurugu. Um, it is a powerful book that kind of uh, gives an analysis of um, European-centered uh, cultural values and worldview. And um, I think that it's important to, to name um, that at least in the work that we're talking about in pursuit of Black land and food sovereignty, white supremacy as um, being, as, as you can hear her alluding to, being a, um, a virus, right? Like, and the way that uh, Black people in this pursuit, from my perspective, can uh, ward off the effects of the virus or having is, you know, uh, to do that is to build the immune system. Um, and in this case, the proverbial immune system in this case is the culture of the people. And so, if the question is, well, what do you mean by white supremacy? Here's an offering that I have in quotations that I've used and shared and written about. And it's not perfect, it's just an offering. I say that white supremacy or inst institutional racism and oppression are the, the cumulative effects of the power generated by the standardization of white people, white institutions, white culture, and generally the European-centered worldview 
and it's embedded in just about everything that we do in terms of our social, political, economic, and other structures. And it's uh, when I talk about white supremacy, it's less about overt practices of bigotry. These are just one example. This is more about the institutional and systemic natures of 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 uh, you know white supremacy and this standardization and the the power that's generated by uh, white is standard or white is right. And so if we understand from that perspective, and if the goal of, as I mentioned in the last slide, of uh, Black land and food sovereignty is rehumanizing ourselves, I think that what follows is that white supremacy um, and oppression that's based on race, class, and other institutional oppression then dehumanizes us, right? And so uh, a pursuit of sovereignty that does not seek to rid us of the uh, continually and evolutionarily, I'm not saying that I'm like, hey, cause I got my African shirt on, you know, then white supremacy doesn't affect me, yay. Um, but it's always with us, right? And so, but I will say that a pursuit and a practice that does not undo, does not seek to understand and undo the impacts of white supremacy uh, as a part of the work is countercultural to sovereignty as a pursuit of black liberation. And I'm only I'm breaking down uh, where I'm breaking down the building blocks into helping to understand that or hoping. And after this, I want to hold space to see if folks have any questions. But again, I think that it requires an analysis of and an actual work of figuring out how to create for ourselves um, our own cultural underpinnings and cultural analyses that allow us to create the type of sovereignty beyond just like access to food, land, money, all these things, but really sovereignty or control of how we think and how we see the world, right? That is critical to this work. And, and at the baseline for why we have to create institutions that are not just as uh, Mattel back in the day and so many other like doll companies will create the black version of the white Barbie, right? No, we're not talking about that. We're actually talking about a new form, a new mold that's created by the people who are the pursuers of our own rehumanization. It's not like, how do we become um, like white folks, but how do we first, before anything, sovereignty looks like defining for ourselves, what does it look like to be ourselves? What does our food look like? What is our food? What type of economic structures do we wanna operate in? How do we operate with them? And in our case, how do we do that within the world that we still live in as well and not attempt to act like the world around us doesn't exist? But we have to, uh, one big recognition has to be that uh, we have to see that um, there is an undoing process that has to happen and a pursuit of Black land and food sovereignty has to not only stop at the level of developing analysis, but also about creating the type of institutional, uh, the cultural underpinnings that will be the, the baseline of our, uh, of our uh, institution building and whether that's around our practices of honoring ancestors or it's around our practices of creating uh, different types of, of language, uh, how we engage in community, how we build teams together, how we gather resources, how we think about resources. And we'll talk about that later. But I think when we talk about uh, um, institution building um, for Black land and food sovereignty in pursuit of Black liberation, we've got to be clear that white supremacy uh, has to be dealt with in whatever ways we uh, we decide that we do that. So anyway, I want to pause here really quickly. I know that um, from Dr. Marimba Ani and myself gave you a lot, but just want to hold space to see if there are any questions, thoughts, concerns before I move forward. I can't see if folks are interested to, to share. And so if you shared, if you joined after, uh, please put, you know, um, Maybe uh, put the um, you know yeah. So, brother Amber, yeah. Unmute you. Can you unmute yourself, Sister Amber? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, first, thank you so much. Um, and I, I'm trying to figure out how to put this into a question, but 
one of the things I guess, I guess the question is, what do you kind of use as a foundation or a framework? So when we start thinking about recovering um, wisdom and recovering knowledge and recovering the information that we would use to build these containers and to build these um, institutions and um, these kinds of things, where are you looking back to specifically um, and kind of, and how are you doing that? So for example, one of the things that becomes very complicated as black people, particularly when we start talking, when we are grouping ourselves as people of color and all these other things is there is a very specific journey. There is a very specific disconnect. There's a very specific um, reconnecting that needs to happen for black folks. So I wonder, is it a matter of figuring out who your specific, you know, what land you specifically originated from and looking back to this to then figure out what did these people eat and how did these people raise the food? How do we find, um, how can we find solidarity amongst our, amongst ourselves as a group when there's so many differences within the group and then so much disconnection from any of that information to begin with? So I hope that there is a question in there. I just wonder if there's a, if there's kind of a guidance that you use and that you offer for what should what should we be using to to form these systems? Sure, sure. Now, that's a, a great inquiry, and I heard about 117 questions out, out of that, uh, which is good. And so we should definitely uh, stay connected so we can talk more about that. Um, this is absolutely a intro, intro level types of you know getting us thinking about um, you know our our um, our pursuit. So I appreciate your, your inquiry. Um, you, it seems that you are speaking to what uh, a um, principle for us of um, the practice of St. Kofi, right? Not just it as a value, but what does it look like to reach forward to the past? And for some people, it's like, how do you reach forward to the past? Well, here's how you do it. You learn about, um, or at least one way to do that is to consider governance structures that um, that come from throughout the African diaspora. And I think that the nuances around how we do that, Amber, uh, and for anybody else who favors this question, um, I think that it is a matter of, you know, de deciding how uh, specific or, uh, or how um, precise, right, you want to be in terms of learning. Uh, as Dr. Marimba Ani talks about the Ma'afa, for some people we might call that uh, the transatlantic slave trade or what have you. Um, but the, I think you're right in describing that what, what we're dealing with is a disconnection from who we are, i.e. the, the, re, the rehumanizing work that's gotta happen, the restoration and, and uh, regeneration that's gotta happen. And so us defining where we learn those from, I let folks decide that. But the deep practice of, of, of uh, learning about these different practices through a, at least for us, and we'll talk about this later, um, political education and community building that allows us to learn. And when I say political education, I, I recognize that people have different definitions of that. Um, it could be technical skills. It could be learning from specific you know, political frameworks or whatever it might be. And so um, it really depends on who you are. Uh, we have a framework for how, how we do that and we can talk about that later. But um, I think it's a matter of, of learning as much as we can. So what we try to do is look at uh, various models from the African diaspora and uh, uh, defining, um, first getting clear about the matrix. So what are we trying to learn? What, what are electoral uh, practices? What are, um, uh, how do people make decisions or how did people make decisions and what frameworks and so what we uh, tried to do in what context. So what one of the things that we're doing now is just like developing a study of 
what do what does uh, um, African governance structures look like pre-colonial uh, or pre uh, pre um, imperialism, if you will? I would say white uh, imperialism. And what does it look like in terms of uh, freedom, you know, within freedom and liberation struggles and movements, uh, whether we're studying maroon communities or we're studying um, uh, nomadic communities, pre, you know, pre-colonial nomadic communities and learning about those governance structures and trying our best to um, connect from what those things were to what the 21st century offers for us. Because I mean, you're not gonna be able to do that one for one. In fact, I don't think we want to, we wanna evolve. The idea of, of, uh, of Sankofa is to go and fetch it, right? So to go and get the lessons, those that work, those that didn't work, and then figure out how to do that um, in the 21st century in ways that allow us to see ourselves as, um, as a part of that and living that out um, in, in, a, in a sense of like, uh, living ancestral glory in that same way, not just pouring uh, libation, but being like, yeah, we're going, we actually going to uh, rev that up and build it up. Because who, who wants to do the same thing that generations in the past did? I, in fact, I think that that's dishonoring more than honoring. But but you have to, we have to have enough in our uh, cash or our menu of options to know. So it's deeply studying liberation movement, um, post-colonialism and pre-colonialism to know first and then figure that out for us. Um, I, I'm, I wouldn't suggest trying to find out, all right, well, uh, Guinea-Bissau, uh, that that area um, was where my folks were because of genealogy and all. I wouldn't say that because of me, and I'm not saying don't do that, but I'm saying like study it all within a group, not by yourself, but in a group to find out um, what exists, how it exists, and try to figure out what how those things work for us within the context of, of our movement work today. Um, that That's a suggestion that I have a uh, long-winded answer uh, to that and, and uh, definitely open to more conversation later. Thank you so much. Karen, looks like you got your hand up. Yes, thank you. I, um, I would like to state that from what I know of uh, living in Africa, um, you're absolutely right on in uh, some of the things that you just said, um, particularly the issue of community building, because that's how, <laughs> that's how it works there. That's how it's worked there for thousands of, and millions of years. Or we wouldn't all be here question? right now if they didn't do that. Um, we would be probably, it would be a forest where you're sitting. Um, and the other thing is uh, from observing the recent uh, COP 20, uh, 20, 20, 20, 26. Do you have a question? Yeah, um, well, I, I just wanted to, to say that there are contemporary youth environment groups around the world many in Africa that can uh, assist you with information and connections there, and that your communities are both urban and rural communities uh, to just do the same actions. Um, I've lived in Kenya myself. So Karen, real quick, again, do you have a question? I Well, I did ask a question in the chat, which is, does your organization have a way of vetting local, state, and federal uh, um, candidates to align with your goals. Gotcha. Um, thank you for that. I didn't see the uh, chat. I appreciate that. So um, uh, yes, we do. Um, I mean, it is uh, one that I wouldn't consider as a formal uh, vetting process. Um, however, we do have uh, more of a um, a process, a way of, of vetting people who are direct partners and contributors to our work. And we do that through uh, a series of, um, of vetting levels, if you will. Uh, part of it is uh, political education that uh, an intensive that we ask people to participate, participate in um, that offers up uh, four sessions, three of them self-paced, one in person. Um, that we essentially, uh, we invite rigor 
because we want to be clear that um, as we are, and I, you know, uh, Sister Amber, um, as I, you know, as we mentioned before, thinking about maroon communities, one thing that we learned about is like, you know, in order to get deeper and deeper into the freedom work, we got to back people out. Just because you're talking a good game don't mean that that means anything. And so what we try to do at try our best is have these layers, or if you will, in other contexts, rites of passage to, to, you know, to connect, right? There's the public facing work. There is the next level of figuring that out. And then it's the figuring out where people are and who they are, uh, institutions and the people within those institutions. And we're very careful about how we do that. Um, and then we just, you know, part of the work uh, to, to answer another layer of your question, Karen, uh, as we think about this work um, is really discernment, right? It's not always about just a particular criteria or check the box. It's really about this, does this feel right? Or are people in a, in a good place? Um, uh, are there, is there a mission? Are the people really, you know, ready and willing to do the work? So um, that's how we've been, you know, building thus far and it's been helpful for us. So. Thank you for your uh, for your question. Uh, we want to move forward really quickly, uh, just so that you know we we you know go uh, go forward. Um, I would just say I don't want to keep you know move us uh, along too slowly, so that uh, Brother Lee and, and then Sister Phil can move forward about how we're living these concepts out. Um, but we say that you know the building blocks of movement are relationships, right? And so our work is about building relationships and how that happens. Uh, is is through some of that is through the vetting process, but deep one on ones, really seeing folks as human and not seeing us as, um, you know, seeing people as utilities. So spending time building relationships, uh, authentic ones, at least that's what we intend to do. And and moving from that perspective, you know, uh, building um, at least for us sharing the need and, and of uh, building relationships that are connected to not just institutional relationships, but also independent and, uh, uh, sorry, interpersonal and intrapersonal relationships that allow um, us to continue to do the work of institution building, because it's, it's necessary, right? When, when the rally is over and the demonstration is over, where are we move into, right? And we need, uh, we need protection. If we're gonna actually embody these ideas, um, we're gonna have to create the types of structures that allow for those things to live. And so for us, um, we are looking, we're clear that tomorrow's sovereignty can only happen by creating the types of systems, operations, resource practices, uh, I'm sorry, resource development practices, principles, and accountability structures in our work today. And I, I'll assert, and I'll say it later, that sovereignty is not possible without the establishment of an institution that allows for it to live and thrive. So I'm going to stop there and, and, you know, bring Brother Lee in to talk about how Black Yield Institute is actually doing that in our day-to-day -day operations. Uh, peace, y'all. Um, hope everybody can see me well. Sorry about the hood. It's a little chilly in here today. Um, so I am Brother Lee, Director of Operations and Culture at Black Yield. I'm excited to talk to you all about the practices of oper I'm sorry, <laughs> operationalization. Talk about tongue twister. Uh, operationalization, um, but really talking about it uh, as a concept or methodology, if you will, generally, but largely inside of our liberation. Movement. So I'm gonna go ahead and just jump into it. Okay, um, so before operations, um, I wanna offer up the perspective of clarity, right? So before anything is built and operations being the understanding of how the ins and outs of our organization works, uh, how the different mechanics work, what wheels turn what, and what's connected to what, um, but before any of that can be built um, and talk about being managed, we have to talk about clarity and we have to talk about getting clear about what our uh, organization will necessitate. So what exactly does our organization need? Um, and I lifted up the severity of clarity uh, is heavily based upon the time, energy, uh, resources and relationships that are all connected, uh, moving into the space without being clear about the things you want to build and what you're hoping to your purpose, what your uh, goal of your organization is, um, is going to yield wasting or losing uh, those resources of time, energy, uh, of resources and relationships. So wanted to lift that up on the front end. Um, great. Yeah. I'm just listening along to something. Um, so how do we get clear? 
So one way we get clear about what our organization wants to do or the goal or the purpose of our organization is we ask questions, ask questions and be asked questions, ask questions to your peers, ask questions directly to those that will be affected by your organization or those of whom you are working with. Um, in addition, uh, be in community, be in community. I think that's something that's often overlooked um, or undervalued. However, the, uh, the, the time we spend with community, I think we learn a lot more than we'll learn um, with the assumption or moving with the understanding that we know a better way to do things. Um, so I always wanna say engage with community. Um, and Brother Eric just actually talked about research, but Sankofa, which is the idea, which is the methodology of going to fetch, uh, but go and fetch all the understandings of your organization. Look at those who showed us that you'll be standing on. Um, look at the, the organizations that have come before you, uh, how they work and how they didn't work um, and learn from those as much as you can. Um, and lastly, uh, this is my little car mirror, uh, but reflection, reflection. When we wake up in the morning and we go and get dressed, um, we look in the mirror and we get ourselves together and put on our good stuff. Um, that reflection tells us if we are where we want to be or we are satisfied with our physical appearance. However, reflecting on ourselves, uh, our experiences, um, our, our spiritual experiences and things we are connected to will give us that same information, just providing us feedback with being clear about where we are in this organization um, and how do we uphold our purpose inside of it. And um, at any point, I want to save time uh, for questions. So if you have one, please uh, let me know, and I'll try to get it on the back end of this uh, of this uh, my my portion. Okay. So mechanics of operations. Now I want to offer this up in the idea of a toolbox, right? Uh, so if we broke operations uh, down inside of our organization and how we are practicing it, you'll get four different things. Uh, the first thing you're going to get is processes, right? Uh, creating these different operations, these different processes that are uh, that are necessitated inside of the organization and by those who are inside of the organization. Um, next, you want to talk about tracking, right? Performance tracking and analyzation. Um, I couldn't really find a good picture for tracking, so I stuck with the duck feet. Uh, so bear with me on that. <laughs> but performance tracking and analyzation, just being clear about what you're tracking and why you're tracking, um, that's a major part of any organization, especially if you're talking about growth. Um, next uh, is support, right? Management and support. What does that look like? What does that look like inside of your organization? I always, uh, a small thing, but I always offer it up because it's necessary everywhere and it never looks the same anywhere. So I wanted to lift that up. Um, and lastly, uh, uh, and y'all gonna learn that I pronounced this a little bit differently uh, than folks have in the past, but this is called uh, organizational health and chemistry. If you can say that for chemistry, chemistry. Um, so as we move on and we break down those four different parts of what's, in us, what's inside of our toolbox, I wanted to offer up a perspective uh, or analogy, if you will, that I think makes it a little bit easier to understand how we flow through the operations. So here's a perspective to offer. Um, imagine yourself as a mechanic um, and you're building a car, right? And let the car be our institution, understanding that it has all these different moving parts and all these considerations that have to be made, uh, depending on what the goal of the car is, right? So as we move into talking about operations and processes, uh, Brother Eric talked about this with our liberation, our liberation container, but one of the things we have to be clear about is creating the container for what you want to happen. Um, and one model I wanted to lift up to have folks think about it in this way. Um, if folks are familiar with Ferrari, generally most folks are. Um, if you haven't, uh, let me know the rock you stand behind. Um, but uh, Ferrari, if you've seen a Ferrari, you understand that they're generally built low to the ground uh, they generally have uh, thicker tires, and it's specifically for the reasons of racing or making the car go fast, uh, built for speed, if you will. You're able to cut corners and keep the tread on the ground a lot lighter. Um, and if you're thinking about uh, Jeeps and how Jeeps are built, they're generally built for durability, uh, generally built to withstand uh, and be able to uh, go through kind of almost any kind of circumstances. So two different kinds of cars, right, yield two different kinds of organizational builds. And that's what I want folks to really take away from that is that you want to be clear, as we talked about in the first slide, about what is our organization doing? Because then out of that clarity, you'll understand if you're building a Ferrari or if you're building a Jeep. Um, so with that being said, consider all of those moving pieces and consider each of the function of all those different moving pieces. Uh, now, what does that look like in our work? What does it look like in the, in the context of our liberational work? Um, so really, it's creating whatever the organization necessitates. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about vetting processes. Uh, Brother Eric talked about our fire starter course, which, uh, which are three self-taught courses and then uh, one in-person course. Um, we have our onboarding and offboarding processes. 
being clear about how folks are transitioning to the work and how folks are transitioning out of the work. Uh, we have methods of support. I talked about uh, a few slides ago, talked about how support never generally looks the same everywhere, but being clear about different ways you're gonna have to support in different, uh, different capacities. Uh, just the understanding that um, you can't use the same tools for every job. Uh, and I, I think that's really what I wanna lift up there. Uh, performance and data tracking and analysis, just being clear about what your organization is producing, um, where are your red flags, where are your green flags, uh, and, and how can you troubleshoot. Um, uh, method correction uh, and regenerative accountability, uh, really just being clear about how you all are holding each other accountable, how we operate inside of our organization uh, with regenerative accountability is any, uh, any if you will, if you will uh, mishaps or uh, setbacks that we may have, one of the ways we are inefficiencies, yeah, I, I use that word better, uh, inefficiencies that we may have would allow us to create uh, not consequences, but regenerative consequences, if you will, that are also staying in line with our goal. Um, so if uh, if Lee misses a meeting or Lee uh, is not able to complete something that was my responsibility, part of me making that up and, and supporting my team and being accountable for myself is to either uh, step into another space and support that way or take on uh, a space off of somebody else's plate. But however, if you're being clear, it's still moving towards the same goal. We're not sitting folks in corners. Nobody's being punished. Uh, and it, But it's, it, it's the reality of, and everything we do, we want it to be focused on Black Line of Full Sovereignty. So if we can give you a lesson inside of doing the work that still leads us there, that's a plus for us and that's how we're operating. Um, next, we talk about streamlining our operations, just making sure everything's uniform across the organization. We have what, we, what is called the BYI way where we are housing all of our processes um, and all of our operations. Anything that you are not clear about with BYI, you can find there. And that allows us to streamline it throughout our organization and allow folks to always have something to refer, uh, reference in times of questions. Uh, workflow, I didn't, not yet, but I'll, I'll make sure I add that. Uh, but workflow as well, um, just being clear about uh, how folks are spending their time, workflow and time management, if you will, being clear about how folks are spending their time, what work are they being connected to and what parts of the, uh, and what parts of the organization. And lastly, Brother Eric offered up something I did not have on here. But um, one of the major things that we actually got accomplished this year that proved to be one of the best operational processes that we could have uh, implemented was having standard operating procedures. Uh, and, and, and typically they're called SOPs. But what happened with us there is that we're able to document how any part of our organization operates, how it functions. So therefore what happens there is you make all of those inside of your organization interchangeable, right? There's no one person that can't do any job um, and, and that ups the value of the team at large. And having SOPs um, is really just being clear about how things are done. It's on paper. Uh, it's never to question. And if ever, if ever there is a question, you have a reference to go to for. Cool. Nice. I'll move on. And lastly, I'm sorry, before I move, I want to lift up this quote I have at the bottom. Um, Systems remove emotions uh, by unknown. Uh, I, I really don't remember who uh, I heard it from. But however, it stuck with me and I, I always refer back to it. But just being clear about if you want to have a good flow inside of your organization, if you want folks to be able to gel, work together, you have to be clear and have standardized processes that you all have chosen collectively to operate by uh, and have committed to um, inside of your organization. But being clear that uh, there has to be a process, there has to be a system, it has to be a way that it works. It can't be um, temporarily uh, something that, that happens whenever you get to that point. So if we're vetting, we have to know how we're going to vet months before it's time to vet. So. Um, and I'll move on to the next slide. So we're talking about tracking and analysis now um, and why track and analyze the work that we're doing with the data that we have. And I wanna take you all back to the garage uh, and give you this understanding and talking about this in reference to a car. I want folks to think about, uh, and I use the car analogy because I assume everybody has been able to either uh, experience a car or drive one. Um, I won't assume drive for everybody. I, 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 you know, I know that can go. Um, but, why, uh, but why are we tracking and analyzing, right? So inside of cars, we're very clear that there are so many things that are simultaneously, and I think that's an important piece, but simultaneously simultaneously being tracked. Um, I lifted up just a few here. You talk about uh, the odometer tracking our speed, talk about uh, the fuel tracking what's in the car, how much fuel we have left. Um, you talk about uh, tire pressure, how much air does our tires have, um, and even tracking the temperature of the car, right? All these different things, are happening inside of this one machine all at one time. And they're all working together simultaneously to be clear about uh, or have an output of what the car is doing, uh, what the car's health is, uh, and how the car's operating. 
And I want to offer that perspective right over to the liberation work uh, as well. Um, but uh, offering tracking is just equals information. And then the analysis of that information is going to lead to what grows your organization. Um, and how does that look, right? The flow of tracking and analyzation. So one, um, I want to uplift, always track purposefully. Uh, sometimes you'll find yourself tracking things that feel like they're good to track, but don't necessarily yield anything or do anything for your organization. Uh, and what that does is burn time, burn energy and burn resources. So one of the processes we move by is getting very clear about what does it make sense to track, what is necessary to track, and how would that, how would tracking uh, this specific thing uh, yield us uh, or benefit us in the long run. Um, we also talk about just identifying all the functions and relationships of what you're tracking. Make sure that everything you're tracking, knowing what it's connected to, uh, and this would be knowing that uh, the temperature of the car is going to be connected to uh, if the car shuts off. This is knowing that the speed of the car is connected to the car's uh, longevity, right? But just being clear about all these different parts you have, how they're connected, and how their relationship are working. Um, figuring out what are the best tools to use. So when building processes inside of your organization, you're going to uh, figure out different platforms and different ways to build these tools that are going to work best for you all. I always say, please look up as many platforms as you can um, and get clear about uh, why you want to use those tools and what those tools do for your organization and what you're tracking. Um, we also talk about this qualitative versus quantitative tracking, right? And really, that's the idea of that we're tracking the numbers, but we also want to track the things that we can't see. Right? We want to track the things that will give us that complete narrative of what happened throughout this year. So yes, we'll be able to track what we're growing. We'll be able to track the amount of folks we've been able to engage with. However, what we aren't tracking or, or what we want to be tracking in addition is uh, what conversations yielded out of what events, uh, right? What, what kind of engagements uh, or how many engagements of uh, political folks have come out of our monthly events. But it's just uh, really both inside and outside of your organization, tracking to have that whole picture and that whole narrative of what's happening with your organization. Because at times what you'll do is we'll track these numbers and not get the numbers we want when it's time to output, but forget and don't have the, uh, don't, don't, re, uh, re, don't return back to the understanding that there were several things that took place, right? That could have, uh, that makes sense for why the numbers look how they look. So offering that up. Uh, and the last few is really just giving you an actual flow but the, having accurate data is going to yield have an, an accurate output, and that accurate output is going to yield an accurate diagnosis. So as long as your data is correct, you, uh, all, your true, all your tools are tracking correctly, you'll get the correct output of what's happening in your organization. And then from that, you should be able to identify red flags and diagnose any issues that you have. And as long as that, that process is correct, uh, any diagnosis you have should yield uh, an accurate solution. So that should be a clear cut understanding of uh, what options do we have as far as solutions to fix the problems that have come about inside of what we're tracking and what we're analyzing. Okay, and I think I don't have uh, much left for folks. Um, about two more slides left, so bear with me. Um, next piece I want to talk about is the management of support. Uh, one of my favorite pieces, if you will, um, very, very big on knowing your personnel inside of your organization, being clear about uh, who you have, who you're working with, uh, strengths, weaknesses, uh, how to grow folks, how to hold space with folks, but really doing that job of uh, deepening your relationships and building with each other, being clear, um, and I'll offer up this image, being clear that everybody has a role. Everybody has a role and part of your role as tracking and managing these folks and supporting folks is to understand them, understand all of their roles as if they were your own. So I offered up this picture here where you see a NASCAR pit um, and those who uh, are fans of NASCAR or understand NASCAR, inside of the pit, they maybe stay here for under 60 seconds, right? It's very detrimental to them. If they stay too long, it'll get them out of position in the race. But as you see in this picture, everybody has a job. Everybody has a job and all things are going at one time. And part of the work is knowing that everybody has a job. So that way you actually can and, and have the ability and the capacity to support these folks. Because if you aren't clear about what they should be doing, if you aren't clear about how that angle of your organization should look, that would that would hinder you in being able to support in the capacity that we like to. Um, and a quote from a handsome brother here, uh, in order to provide support, you must have the capacity to identify the problem. Please. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, but management and support, right? So management and support, management and support looks like um, both individual and collective. So individually with staff, being able to connect with folks, 
um, being able to build those relationships, but also um, have the actual agenda to break down, spend time with them uh, and go deep into uh, what their role is, how they see their self in their role and what the support look like for them, not what you think support looks like for them, but actually getting it from them. And then you also wanna keep it, uh, keep a monitor on collective organizations. So uh, just as folks talk about their businesses being their baby, our organization is just like another person to us at large. Yes, we are all connected to it, but part of our work is making sure that our organization is healthy uh, as a whole. Uh, and then we all operate uh, and play a role inside of that. Uh, management support also looks like just periodic, periodic workflow tracking. Part of what our team does is uh, track weekly, uh, just that flow of work. Um, we do it throughout a work plan. Just another process that we, uh, or another uh, process that we added um, and really allow folks to track their time, track how they're spending their time um, and allows us to identify means of support inside of the work. Um, we have our one-on-ones uh, bi-weekly where we connect with each other. Um, and really go into our work plans, talk about what support that we need, talk about uh, any additional um, any additional uh, kind of things that folks want to lift up. Um, and when I say support, I want to I want to lift up, especially inside of those one on ones. Support isn't just listening and responding. Support is might look like uh, reteaching. Support might look like let's do a political education together. Support might look like giving somebody a project to grow their skills that they want to do better at. Uh, or work on, but all of those things are tailored to depending on who's sitting in front of you. And that takes us back to just knowing your personnel and your organization. Uh, asking the right questions is a necessity. You wanna be clear about um, bringing out the information in folks so they can also understand their positions and their roles in the same way that you see it, uh, ensuring that everything is aligned. Um, understanding self-care, learn how to take care of your team um, is, is very keen in longevity. Uh, our team does a work plan. I'm sorry, I apologize. Our team does a self-care plan uh, where we identify the best ways we think are possible to take care of ourselves while being inside of the work. Um, and we operate by that uh, year long and revisit, uh, continue to make adjustments where we see fit. But it's a very clear understanding of ways to take care of ourselves, knowing that this work is going to tax us and take a toll on us. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, but using the right tools for the job, knowing, uh, knowing how to um, support the right kinds of folks um, having those quarterly reflections, uh, spending time, we talked about reflections earlier, but spending time with folks, being able to hear how they seem themselves over the last few quarters, being able to understand why their work uh, is or why their data is output is how it is, whether good or bad, it, it, that reflection gives you the context that you're looking for. Um, and we talked about method correction uh, and we uplift celebrations inside of our work. That's part of the support as well. If you are uh, disciplining inside of your organization and however that may look for you all, it is imperative that you celebrate folks as well. It has to be a balanced scale and folks have to understand um, the means of what it means to be supported, but also be corrected. Um, and lastly, I wanna lift up this understanding of Siesta. Uh, and I'm not sure if folks are familiar with Siesta. And for those who aren't, Siesta is something that I personally experienced uh, inside of Europe um, in 2016 um, in uh, Spain. And uh, folks were, uh, I went to a bodega around maybe noon in Spain and I got to the bodega, everything happened to be closed. And that threw me for a loop because I'm from uh, Baltimore city where you can go to a gas station in the middle of the night. But the understanding that was taught to me was that inside of, uh, in Spain, they spend from 12 to 5 p.m. or 12 to 3 p.m., I'm sorry. They spend time with their families uh, and just pretty much regenerating themselves getting the support they need, um, and just even having time to eat. But in that time, everything is completely shut down. Nobody's working. Uh, no grocery stores are open. No bodegas. You're not getting gas. None of that has happened. Everybody's home. And to see that implemented um, that large inside of a whole city, and I'm sure it goes further than that, but I experienced the whole city being that way, is something that I thought would be major inside of our organization to spend some time at least once a week where we are doing a siesta, which means do whatever it is that might, might uh, support you or that you feel like uh, might be beneficial to you. Sometimes it's spending time with each other and just kicking it and building with each other, playing some cards. I'll light somebody up in space and some of y'all play space, or playing some cards. Or it might look like folks just going home, spending some time with their families. But we ensure that we have it. We do it at least once a week. Um, and it's for a whole day. Um, and the last thing I have um, is that word I taught you all about earlier, um, chemistry. <laughs> chemistry 101. Um, but, but for me, I want to uplift that this is understanding the interior design of your organization. Uh, just being clear about 
how does all this stuff on the inside work, right? How does it all gel, gel together? How are we making it all work together? Um, I used the inside of a Bugatti. I just thought it was a really nice car. Uh, but the inside of it, as you can see, just supports each other. The understanding that it's going for a classy luxury look. You have your uh, leather seats, you got your uh, cool vents and things of that nature. But imagine that as the inside of your organization, um, you have this container now, right? And you need to figure out how to stock that container and make that space for those things to continue to happen, uh, for growth to continue to happen, and for folks to continue to build with each other. Um, and a guide, uh, a chemistry and liberation guide, um, I wanna quickly lift up is just thinking about sustainability, having these collective workspaces, having what is called liberators uh, zones from Dr. Um, um, Ed Whitfield, uh, Dr. Ed Whitfield, um, where you talk about having space for folks to just be um, and be corrected if need be. Um, energy reciprocation, ensuring that folks are reciprocating the energy that you are putting out into each other. You have to pour into each other's cups. It's a major thing. Uh, building relationships, you want to deepen your relationships. You want to challenge your folks, uh, get them outside of the comfort zone. We recently did a, um, a creek walk inside of the woods. Uh, and our folks consist of folks for all different ages. And the creek walk turned out to be something that we were all able to lean on each other. Completely uncomfortable, um, but, but definitely an experience that I think helped us grow a lot. Um, that collective performance and skill building. Um, and also part of our relationship building that happens at our annual retreats, which one, we have a mental health retreat directly uh, aligned with being able to take care of ourselves and take care of our mental. Um, and then we also have an annual planning retreat where we build together and plan together and also spend some time just deepening in our relationship. Uh, and last few things I have is political education, just unifying the language, why we do what we do. Um, we also, I lifted up celebrations earlier before, um, but we do monthly and quarterly celebrations. We do monthly gatherings with each other, uh, spending some time with each other outside the office is major, but also making some time to reflect about those experiences, talk about how folks felt inside of that space, talk about what emotions came about inside of whatever challenges, but allowing folks to really uh, pull together their reflections and bounce off of each other and understand at large that, uh, that this thing of chemistry is a tool. Right, we're happy to have it, and it's something that that generally happens while we're having a good time or in the flow of things. But reflection on that uh, is a necessity if you want to uh, get the kind of stuff you want to get out of. Really, what is just being clear about why folks are there and what folks should be taken away from. Um, and lastly, outputs you should see from this guy is just different areas of growth, um, areas of mediations where where you can get folks to work together differently or work together better. Uh, strengths within strength, so you know how you'll see somebody who. Uh, who may be great at something, right? And then you'll have an experience with them and you realize that there are also other strengths that they have brought to the table with them that you aren't allowing them or haven't made the space for them to exercise. And what we wanna do all the time is putting people in the positions they are to win, right? We're, we're, not, asking, um, we're not asking trees to leap, right? We're not asking frogs to stand straight up and, and for years at a time. Probably wasn't the best analogy, but, um, but the, the clear, being clear about knowing who we have and knowing who we are and knowing how we all show up. So when you're talking about building a strong team, um, you're talking about knowing personnel, talk about knowing where to put folks, knowing how folks are going to show up in these different spaces. So um, that's all I have for the, the, the operationalization piece. Um, and <clears throat> I know, I'm not sure we have time for questions about that. OK. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you all for letting me share. Oh, I'm sorry. Take care of your car, and it will take care of you. But if you take out that car, you're going to get your organization. Well, thank you, Brother Lee and Brother Eric. Um, I'm grateful to be on the leadership team with y'all. Um, one thing that I can ask of y'all while we're doing this, since y'all are sharing the screen, can y'all just go to the next slide? Oh, got y'all. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sister Teal, and I have the pleasure of being the Director of Finance and Sustainability at Black Yield. Um, I'm grateful to be doing this work. Um, yeah, grateful to be doing this work and grateful to be here with you all today. So before we get started, um, before we get started talking about the practice of developing liberatory resources, I wanna talk about how important it is to be clear about the essence and the ethos of your organization before you start asking people for support. Um, as an unap unapologetically Black-led organization, it's important for us to always honor who we are, how we move, and how we show up for ourselves. Um, so why is it important to always show up who, who you are and honor your ethos? Um, white, white philanthropy has this way of telling people what to do and how to do it. Um, and I'm going to quote Audrey Lord when I say this. And she said, 
the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Um, black institutions are always often shaped by the options offered by white philanthropic institutions. Um, it restricts how we move. It funnels our work in different directions than we intended. Um, and most of the time, it typically doesn't align with the operations created uh, by black institutions. So how do you move away from this? And how do you always value and understand the ethos of your organization? You understand your mission, your vision, and your, mi your mission and your vision statements. Um, for me, it's important that you see yourself in the work. Um, you can't talk to funders and you can't talk about your organization if you don't see yourself in the work. Um, it's important to honor your ancestors and the people who paved the way before us. Again, you can't be out here asking people for money and talking about your organization without honoring the people that came before you. Um, for us at BYI, it's also important for us to honor ourselves and the culture that we created. The last thing is, it's definitely just okay to say no. Um, if a white organization is asking something of you that you don't want, <laughs> whether that's a report that you don't have time for or something else crazy that we see them out here asking us for, it's really just okay to say no and maybe walk away from the $20,000. Um, I promise you, it will definitely come back to you. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about liberatory resource development, it's everything the organization needs to carry out the work and achieve its missions, right? So you think about money, how much it costs to run programs, how much it costs to have staff in the building, how much cash you have on hand. Um, you wanna talk about people, staff, volunteers, donors, partnerships, friends, how much time it takes to actually get these things done, um, how much time it takes to work, how much time it takes to rest, how much time, it ta how much time it takes to celebrate your work. Um, you wanna talk about trainings, think about training. What do we need to be better and to be more efficient? This can look like professional development, conferences, um, self-care plans, how do we support our set staff, whether they need a new yoga mat or they need a new journal. Um, so their liberatory resource development is thinking about all that we need to be able to pull our mission and our vision together. You guys can go to the next slide. How do we do it at BYI? Um, I love gifts. If anybody else, um, they all in the office know that in our group chat, we communicate through gifts. So how do we do it at BYI? The first thing is building relationships and planning for the future. Um, you guys can go to the next slide. You guys can go to the next slide. Yeah. So you guys must have heard Brother Eric and probably Brother Lee mention earlier that relationships are the building blocks of movement. We're very clear at BYI that our work would not happen without the relationships with fellow organizers, supporters, donors, um, spiritual advisors, teachers. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the support um, that we had and the relationships that we built. We're also very clear that the work that we do requires um, building relationships. I can say that the favorite part, my favorite part about my job is actually getting to meet funders, donors, volunteers, and just seeing how our work um, aligns. And we're also clear that we wouldn't be able to sustain our work if the connections that we built weren't, if the connections that we built weren't real. Um, so what it looks like for us is sharing our stories. Um, when we have donor meetings or when we're talking with foundations, we really just take the time to get to know each other. Um, we probably spend the first 10 or 15 minutes in uh, meetings with funders actually laughing and talking and sharing our food stories and how we got into our work. So it's important to just share who you are and show up in the work. Um, understanding your partners and your donors. Um, we're clear that our work requires money. You got, yeah, you got it. You, we're clear that our work requires money. And to get that money, we're clear that we have to understand our donors, but we also want our donors to understand us. Um, Money is only important through the relationships where people have been okay with how we work. Um, we're not down to change our language, change our initiative areas or anything else like that. Um, it's also about creating strategies to find and cultivate new donors. Um, where are your people? How are you taking your Instagram followers from followers to donors? How are you taking the person that you engage with at maybe your fundraising event from just being a person at a fundraising event to a donor? Um, how are you engaging with social media? What does digital engagement look like? Um, if you guys are a part of our email series, um, we just launched a campaign called Keep the Flame Campaign. And over the last month, you've gotten just a series of emails from Eric and I about our work. Um, so how are you engaging with your supporters to move them from just a supporter to a donor? Um, 
And you also want to talk about developing do doable stewardship plans that turn one-time donors into loyal contributors and advocates. Um, we've gone from raising $40 at community events to securing grants of $350,000 um, to going from having no monthly donors to having monthly donors supporting us almost up to $1,200 a month. So it's about really creating and fostering that relationship that you build um, with your donors so that you're able to keep them long-term. Guys can go next. Other less important thing is planning. You gotta see the past, the present and the future. If you're not able to see the past, if you're not able to be present and where you are right now, and at least able to see where you wanna be in three years, um, you might wanna sit down and think about what you're doing. You have to draw the big picture and fill in the details as you go along. And it's okay to not always have all of the little details filled out, but if you can see the big picture, you can definitely uh, see the end. And I like to say, be wild, we didn't start with a lot of money. Um, we had ideas, hopes, and dreams, but what we did always have was a plan. Um, money only came after we were clear about our relationships that we were building and very clear about where we were going. Um, designing liberatory fundraising strategies. Um, what I can say I appreciate about my job is looking at fundraising and the way that it's been and how wide it's been and being able to undo that. Um, and yeah, just being able to undo the way white people have been fundraising. So before it was just directly asking people for money, not building relationships, but I'm able now to see how important it is to build those relationships to get us where we need to be. Um, another thing, Lay out your dollar goals and all of your efforts to achieve them when you're planning. Um, I'm, I literally mean lay out your dollar for dollar goals. All the money that you need to raise for all your initiative areas. Think about all your fundraising plans or your campaigns that you have throughout the year, your fundraising events, um, anything that you have that can bring in money. You wanna lay out your dollar for dollar goals and all the ways that you plan to achieve them. Um, Multi-year funding is the goal. Um, Listen, it takes a lot of time to write grants. And sometimes those grants are only for one year, but you wanna be able to maintain your work and create a sustainability in your work. So you wanna make sure that you're looking for multi-year funding. Um, and whether that's multi-year funding through foundations or that's multi-year fundraising through um, major donors that are, that are interested in maybe giving 100,000 this year, 100,000 next year, and then 100,000 the next year. So you can have 300,000 over the whole three years. So that's why I said it's really important to be able to see the big picture, because when you go into these donor meetings, you have to know what you need two years down the road. Um, and the last thing that I wanna uh, bring up is to diversify your uh, streams of income. Um, we have a farm, we also do consulting. Um, we have a lot of moving pieces that help us be able to bring in money. Um, when I started here last year in September, we pretty much didn't have a major donor program. Um, and now I'm proud to say that we have at least three to five major donors that are contributing at least $25,000 a year to BYI. So it's really all about diversifying your income streams and making sure uh, you have that multi-year funding. But again, you have to see, see the past, see the present and know where you're going to be able to get where you need. Um, and last but not least, next slide. Show gratitude and be grateful. Um, I think I could say over the past six to seven months, as we've been dealing with the land insecurity issue um, for the farm, we've just been so grateful for all the help that we've been getting and coming in and being grateful about where we are, being patient and being slow that we're able to get everything that we need. So in developing uh, liberatory resources, show gratitude, plan and build your relationships. And I can assure that you will get where you need to go. Um, so I'm grateful to be here. Grateful to share the time with you all today and happy to answer um, any questions that you may have. All right, just want to move forward real quick. I know we, we may have some questions, but uh, thank you, Sister Till. We're going to finish out with this. Um, just closing up, right? So we, we see ourselves at Black Youth Institute as um, being a nebula, right? Creating um, processes to create, to help uh, expand our work of social reproduction supporting people independently and or budding or active organizations to support movement work. This is a, for us is a movement framework and for us movement requires coordination. Coordinating what and who? The people who are willing to do the work and preparing new people. And so we see this work as being critical to um, 
uh, to building movement, seeing ourselves as, as an institution that helps to form others, that helps to create processes and as a critical part of our work. Um, and so we, we do that through our mentorship. Brother Lee talked a bunch about that and in ways that affirm who we are. Um, we, we contend that um, uh, white institutions, academic institutions can't prepare uh, liberationists or you know people who struggle for black land and food sovereignty. Uh, we have to prepare people for that. Um, and it's not a bad thing necessarily, it just is. And so um, we have processes that we're doing, you know, utilizing to move that. Um, this is just a, a, another nod to that report that I mentioned. You can get that on our website, uh, blackyourinstitute.org. Um, it's on our front page, but also under reports. Um, and in that, we, you know, how just kind of di this direct quote says, institution building has to be the main thrust of movement institution, which BYI identifies. We are making the road while walking. And in this dispensation of BYI's work, we are truly comf uh, comfortable with building the world while, while walking. It. So one revelatory acknowledgement is that Pan-African uh, uh, are, are uh, you know, build power and, and we have to be okay with that. Um, and so um, at least from my perspective, the, you know, freedom fighters who are concerned with doing this work have to create the type of institutions that we want to see that not only espouse our ideas, but build systems that get us towards sovereignty and, and, and having through those liberatory containers. And so our thought is to be able to contribute largely to the work um, by helping the, the process of social reproduction. Uh, you know, that, uh, and when we say this jokingly, but that allows us to us to um, support the larger work that's happening uh, from a Pan-African standpoint. And that puts us in a position where, um, where essentially we are supporting movement across the diaspora. Um, and we assert that the only way to build movement is to do it. Uh, we got to move from embodiment and not just an espousement of uh, liberation as a, as, a, uh, as a framework or sovereignty or equity or whatever that might be. Um, we believe that we got to, you know, grow institutions that practice what it preaches and in doing so create systems, structures, policies, practices, and accountability, whether they mirror what we talked about or not. Um, we believe that it has to be that and that comes with checks and balances and, and uh, you know, um, critical processes, uh, even self-critical processes, uh, vulnerabilities, relationships and all. Um, and, and I contend that sovereignty cannot happen without the same, you know, uh, through the same mainstream practices, the check in the box, right? Well, we say we're going to do this. It's got to be deeper, uh, more authentic. And um, this, this, types of, this type of practice requires uh, guidance. And so we as an organization could be an organization that helps if your framework is one of uh, pursuit of Black land and food sovereignty. And we argue that, you know, sustainability, uh, if you were going to sustain movement, it's going to require us to institutionalize those, the, the praxis. And um, as I said earlier, um, sovereignty is not possible without establishing institutions that allow for sovereignty to live and thrive, thus creating liberatory praxis containers. So uh, we want to stop there and see if there are any questions, any thoughts, how you feeling. Uh, any questions of any of us? Um, we uh, we have about um, 12 minutes. Um, wish we had more, but we got about 12 minutes to answer any questions that people have um, and, and offer up any perspectives that we can. So I'm going to pause there and see if there's any questions. Thank you all so much. Brother Lee and Eric, can you guys see the questions in the chat? You're on mute. Um, I see the last one that says, I'd love to, I'd love to hear more about how accountability looks in BY or yeah. Black Hill and, and whether there are improvements you think still need to be made to those practices. Um, 
I see that question. Uh, I can I can start with that. Um, so I think to answer the question uh, directly, or or the second part of the question, um, I think it's been alluded to maybe, um, but I'll say it directly. We're always in a uh, space. Liber I, I believe that liberation forward organizations have to be concerned with evolution. Uh, has to be concerned with um, not being perfect, but being uh, relevant and efficient. And so what that means is if we are uh, centered in social movement, then it means where the people are at any given point. And so there's always improvement. Um, if the question is where those improvements are, um, we can talk about that uh, later because I think that there's a running list. And in our report that I mentioned, we talk about lessons learned and things that we could do differently. Um, and uh, what accountability looks like generally, um, one accountability looks like creating or uh, helping people understand that concept of regenerative accountability. Brother Lee mentioned it. Um, I do my best to try to shorten it. That regenerative accountability is really about creating the types of uh, accounts, if you will, to um, being fully immersed in the work and standardizing the goal, not our personal preferences. Um, and what that means is when we talk about accountability, it's not just about um, getting folks, uh, Brother Lee used the, the language method correction. And when we talk about, well, that was uh, an ode to some of the work that we've done in learning more about uh, governance structures, uh, learning about Black Panther Party for self-defense, method correction coming through a justice committee where people uh, counsel elders to do that work and talk about it. Um, to learn what the challenge is. I want to be clear in this space, the challenge could be actually not- We can't hear you, brother Eric. Um, it's a little bit muffled, the sound. Uh, can y'all hear me better now? Oh yeah, that's better. Yeah, give thanks. Um, so, I don't know where people left off, but accountability is on both sides, right? It's looking like um, creating the type of uh, efficiencies that get us toward rest and celebration. So uh, for example, one of, one of the things that actually the members of the leadership team did to hold me accountable, I was working too much. I was tired, they could see that. And what they did was they made me commit to two weeks of leave. Um, I had to sign on the dotted line, literally. And you might think that in, in one context, like how do the people that I supervise get to, you know, tell me what to do? It's because we we do have that type of relationship. And as Brother Lee talked about with the carpet, um, the NASCAR pit, everybody having a job and recognizing that if I'm not resting, I can't be the most effective leader. And so that was that was one thing. Um, and in the case that Brother Lee talked about, you know, not being present for something and not communicating well. Um, it might mean going to help somebody else who's like Brother Jordan, who you'll meet if you come to our workshop on Wednesday, um, in communications, if communication it was an issue, uh, finding a way that, you know, to support communications that build the skills up, but that, again, supports the work and that's not punitive. So that's generally at least two um, types of examples that I would have that are aligned with the work that we do. And again, um, that affirm our work and affirm ourselves as, as African people. So I hope that answers the question directly. Um, I don't see any other questions right now. Um, I'd like to ask a question, but only if others don't have questions to ask because um, you know, I don't want to take this opportunity away from our NISA conference attendees. I'm just going to go ahead since there haven't been, no one uh, shut me down yet. But um, this was an amazing session. I feel like just this offering is. Um, such a gift, I said that in the chat, such a gift to our attendees who wanna start their own organizations. And I was especially 
um, inspired by Teal's presentation on how you approach fundraising. Um, and so I'm wondering um, if I came late to the session and I'm wondering if um, you spoke at all about uh, whether or not Black Yield Institute has a theory of change and how that works in your fundraising work, because it's something that NISOG has been looking to build in our organization. And I, I have this belief that when we're really clear about what we want to do and how we're going to get there and why we're doing it, that that is like something that uh, funders are really inspired by. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to Black Yield Institute's theory of change, if you have one or if you use another kind of tool that um, you use to communicate to your funders exactly like how your approach is going to get to this vision that is on the screen right now. Yeah, um, I can offer up something and also brother Eric, feel free to um, jump in where you are. Um, I wouldn't say necessary a theory of change, but like I said, we um, are very clear around what necessarily what we want to do. And when we talk to funders, we make sure that we are like, we make sure that we tell them what we want to do. And even when we have pushback around um, necessarily changing our initiative areas or at being asked to do a different report than what we uh, agreed to, we really just say no. Um, so I just, I, I think to answer your question, no real theory of change, but just like being very clear on where we want to go and collectively as an organization being on the same page. Um, so yeah, that what I can offer up, Brother Eric, if you or Brother Lee, if you have anything. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Anika had a question in the chat. Yeah. Oh, I go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> I probably stated it better in the chat. Just, I was really inspired by what y'all were saying about your decision-making model, that you were looking towards pre-colonial African decision-making governance models. And I'm sure you're gonna report on that at some point in time, but if you have any resources you could share around that now, that would be incredible, incredible offering to, to me and probably others in this group. I mean, off the top of my head, there's several things and we'll, we'll be offering that. We have a project coming up, a public facing um, project that we call the vault that will include some, uh, uh, what, what I'm calling right now, a contentography, because uh, it's not just a bibliography, but uh, we'll be sharing some things. But uh, off the top of my head, I, I bought this book from the thrift store for like $2.39. Uh, I'm, I'm joking on the price, but it was, it was very inexpensive. Um, it's called Third World Politics. And um, it offered up some examples. And I should note that we're not only focusing on um, African models uh, pre-colonial because we, we're looking at whatever we can learn. Uh, you know, and if they align, they align. Because as far as I'm concerned, uh, many governance structures and many cultures, whether they deviate or not, come out of what we call today as Africa. Um, you know, and so if we look at indigenous practices, indigenous um, governance structures, whether and not just indigenous to this land, but in general, land-based people. Um, but uh, in addition to that, when we are looking at African diasporic examples, there are tons, and I mean, like, I couldn't even think of one off the top of my head, but um, uh, we look at from... In anywhere you think about the disbursement of African peoples throughout the world, and specifically freedom struggles, we're studying, right? From the um, Garifuna peoples of Honduras to uh, um, Campesina communities in Brazil and Suriname, you know, uh, descendants of Maroon communities in Suriname, um, Colombia uh, to um, examples of eco-villages on the continent of Africa to, um, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, freedom towns in this country. Uh, you know, so we're, we're trying to study as much as we can. If we're going to move toward liberation, we're going to learn from the liberationists themselves. 
even if it comes from secondhand through a historian and try to filter through as much as we can and or direct the relationship. So that is, um, that's what I can offer up. Uh, but a, a follow up from here, I could give more. Um, and we can, we can be, I think I had it in one of the slides, but we can be, um, you know, uh, connected. Oh, here we go. Uh, here, any social media, uh, you know, any of our social media sites, uh, our general email info at blackyield.org, um, or following up by learning more information uh, generally, and then precisely and specifically can reach out uh, to that email address and connect with us if you're interested in, you know, learning, like not just learning more, but figuring out how uh, we could offer consultative services or just one-on-ones and just connect. We don't, uh, we don't, you know, talk, we don't uh, participate in the uh, uh, brain harvesting. We don't do no brain picking, but we can build relationships. <laughs> so, um, so we can do that. And that's, we're open to building relationships and sharing info. So. Thank you all so much. I know we went right through the end. If there are other questions, please follow up with us. We're um, absolutely willing to connect with us. And um, thank you all so much. And thank uh, Tony B. for seeing my brother Lee for not only, you know, our presentation, but the work that I do every day. It wouldn't be nothing to talk about if we ain't doing it together. So appreciate y'all. Be well. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.